Let's go on to female anatomy. So again, female gonads are the ovaries. So these are analogous to the testes and vice versa. And the female gamete or the sex cell is the egg or a okay, ovum. And then the, the two sets of primary horm female hormones, you have the estrogens and you have the progestogens, including pro progesterone for the progestogens. Okay, so then external genitalia, we already covered the male. So again, external genitalia are what you can see without having to use imaging or actually going inside and doing some sort of like in, going inside the body. So this is what you can see here. And I think this is actually better than, so again, this is like stretching over here, showing you the vestibule over of the vagina, but this is everything you can see out here. Now, what we have here is like, again, the cross section, the the sagittal view so what we have is the urinary bladder that's the most so again we have a bladder we have our uterus and we have the rectum here so the bladder is going to be the most forward and then we have the urethra so the urethra carries urine from the bladder toward the outside and then we have the uterus right be to, be behind the and actually behind and on top of the bladder and let's go to our first question <laughs> okay fun silly question at the start which way should the toilet paper hang? And don't worry, this won't be on the test. And yes, no correct answer, but I'm just curious. <laughs> okay, let's see what people said. So most of you say that the toilet paper should hang over. All right, speaking of toilet paper, which is the most hygienic way to use the restroom or wipe after using the restroom? So you have your toilet paper. Are you going to wipe front to back or back to front? So hopefully you know what anterior to and posterior are, but again, Anterior is front, posterior is back. So are you going to wipe, start from the front, wipe toward the back, or start at the back and wipe toward the front? Okay, the responses go this way, and this is the recommended way. So there is a recommended way in terms of hygiene. Go from anterior to posterior, so front to back. Here, so anterior to posterior would be this way. So which way should you wipe? Anterior to posterior is this way. Posterior to anterior would be this way. So which way should you wipe? Well, again, here's like looking from below. So here's the inferior view of the female external genitalia. So from this view, this would be the anterior, the front, and this would be posterior over here. So here we have the clitoris over here covered by that prefuse, which is again that hood, just like the prefuse is the free foreskin in the male reproductive system. The clitoris is over here covered by a little hood. Now remember there are three separate orifices in the female reproductive system. So again, the, remember that the bladder is the most anterior compared to the, bat, the uterus and the rectum, right? So the urethra is going to be this separate opening. And believe it or not, like yes, there are, so a common misconception is that the urethra is within the vagina itself. No, it's a separate orifice. So it's a separate, separate opening in the body. And this is the vagina over here. So here's the vagina, the reproductive tract, and then here's the anus. So what happens, why does it matter which way you wipe? Well, again, if you wipe from posterior to anterior, any bacteria that are left over here in this area will come along for the ride. So this is why, in general, it's advised to wipe from anterior to posterior, even though it might be mechanically easier to wipe from posterior to anterior. Again, if there's any bacteria, that can also end up here. It can end up sorry, here at the vagina or it can end up at the urethra. So again, it's best to go from the urethra and like this area and toward the anus rather than the other way around. So anterior to posterior is the preferred way. Then urinary tract infections, it does affect like there's a different difference in terms of risk the, of, have, of a male or female having urinary tract infections. So what's happening with the urinary tract infections? Or let's talk about the bladder specifically. So why is there a difference? Well, there are many factors and one contributing factor is the length of the urethra. Say you have someone who goes number two and they wipe here and they have like bacteria from the rectum here at the extra external urethral orifice. Well, again, which is a longer distance? Let's do a little race with the bacteria. So again, like just by this, how do you, what's the path from the external urethral orifice to the bladder? So we have the bacteria and then again, this is why it's important to also have flow because again, you don't want, you want the flow of urine and washing away any bacteria. You don't want this retrograde, what we call retrograde flow or black backwards flow. 
So what happens is like if you have backwards flow of anything, that can end up back in your bladder and or anything that impedes the flow of urine from the bladder can also increase the risk of these infections as well. So urinary tract infections are very common. Like actually lifetime risk in fe for females is 50 to 60 percent. So if you get a urinary tract infection, does that mean you have poor hygiene? No, it's just like something that happens is pretty darn common. Now males start with a lower risk and does that mean like males have a free pass? No, the thing is that, yeah, maybe in the beginning, like adult females are 30 more percent or 30 percent more likely to develop a UTI. But as males get older, then they start to catch up. So why is that? Well, our ability to control our external urethral sphincter and also the, just our muscle, overall muscle tone, including the muscle tone of our urinary tract, that decreases with age. So, in other words, so the ability to push out urine decreases and we have lower flow, then that increases the chance of like bacteria working their way back into the bladder and causing infection. So this is why, yeah, males aren't in the clear. Sorry, guys. And this is also what is the most common type of urinary tract infection and why it's important to know which way to wipe. Because E. coli is the, is the microorganism, the microbe that you most commonly see in these urinary tract infections. And where do you find E. coli? You find that in gut and feces and that rectum, the digestive tract. So again, this is why it's important not to wipe from back to front, but front to back, because you go from well clean to dirty. And there's a reason why it's called number one and number two. You go from number one to number two, not the other way around. Okay, and then urinary tract infections in men, you can, just because there's a lower risk does not mean that we're in the clear as well. Because why can E. coli is the most, even doesn't matter if it's, if it's female or male, E. coli is also the most common male. So maybe it's a guy who does number two first, wipes and then handles the external urethral orifice. So again, E. coli is, it's, even though your UTIs are less common, it still shows you that it's important to not to, to go from anterior to posterior when you have use of the restroom. So again, don't do this and don't carry this. So first number one, then number two. Don't do number two and then handle number one. Okay, so how can you prevent UTIs? And this is very interesting, actually multiple factors. So it's not just anatomy as well. There are, are some things that can lower the risk. So personal hygiene, especially like and to which way you wipe, but also like how frequent you take baths and also wash that, how well you wash that area as well. And intercourse, that can also affect that as well. There's like, they, uh, there's different studies and actually this one I think is, to, it depends on the country, like they, how much this increases the risk? Well, they also associate like increased risk of UTI with increased um, frequency of intercourse. And clothing, now that one is a little controversial because I was looking at this journal on the top here and it talked about like whether it was cotton versus synthetic and they had an increased odds risk with synthetic like polyester and other synthetic fabrics but it was only like a 1.1 risk so I'm like okay is it really clothing up but it's something so there's but again, UTIs are very common in females, so if you get one, it doesn't mean you have poor hygiene. It's just something that happens, and it's, it's not too uncommon, so it's not some sort of failure on that part. Okay, so then here with the female external genitalia. So this one is the mom's pubis in the anterior, and again, the urethra and vaginal entrance, they do not share the same entrance. So. I mean, some people, I, when I ever talk, taught this in person, I always see some mind, I could literally see some mind, or I shouldn't say literally, but I could see some eyes growing really wide because some people don't know that. But yes, the urethra is a separate opening to the body compared to the vagina. And then what we have here is the labia minora and the labia majora. So these are external. And then we have the vagina, the uh, hymen question. All right, so we, here we have five hymen. So which of these needs surgical intervention? And if you need to zoom in, so A, B, C, D, or E. All right, let's see what people said and the responses here. So most of you said A, and that is correct. So why is that? Well, if we go back to here, so the thing about what are the difference? Well, it's just showing you like, there is no, no quote unquote normal hymen morphology or shape. 
you can have sometimes a annular is like a ring shape and here we have a septate there's a little band of tissue here cribriform there's multiple holes here so it doesn't mean that's abnormal so imperforate means what does imperforate mean or actually let's see imperforate means having no opening at all and paracentroitus now it looks very big but what's this is a specific case where paracentroitus is what happens when maybe let's say a big 8 to 10 to 12 pound object comes through that hymen yeah that happens during vaginal delivery so that's what they call the hymen after giving vaginal birth so this one imperforate that's the one that actually needs an opening I mean um, female might before a pre pubescent female might be okay with the imperforate hymen but once that first menstruation happens what happens is that menstrual fluid will collect and there's no way for it to exit the body because there's no opening so this is why so you would have to have a slight surgical intervention to just create an opening so you kind of have to release the menstrual fluid so that it doesn't accumulate and end up becoming stagnant and also getting infected or causing other ill effects in the body if it just stayed there because menstrual fluid is meant to get rid of you're meant to get rid of menstrual fluid from the body so yes a would need a small incision okay and actually another question so true or false the female reproductive system has erectile t tissue i know someone asked like no opening for menstrual fluid yeah so that's why you need to intervene surgically i mean it's not like a not a complicated surgical procedure but it's like yes you need to have some opening there okay so what did people say so most of <laughs> everyone said true and everyone is correct yes there is erectile t tissue in the female reproductive system I remember like I mean this is even though thankfully everyone attending right now got it correct there are some people like they their eyes get really big when they find that out but yeah what we have here is the vestibule and the vestibule is like okay it's past the labia minora and majora but it's kind of like you know the area between your your lips and your teeth you're not quite in your mouth yet so same with the vestibule it's kind of like between the labia minora and majora and labia shares the same like latin root word it means lips but it's not at the vagina yet so it's like outside the vagina but it's within the labia i think that's where that um, the open sac image shows it better but the vestibule and then we have the clitoris and then we have the glands of the clitoris so just like the penis has a glands so does the clitoris and i also have the prepuce you have the hood covering the clitoris and then what we have is the vulva. So again, the vestibule, I think OpenStack shows it better. So you're not at the vagina yet, your vagina over here. So you have this area. So before you actually get to the vagina and between the labia minora and majora, that's the vestibule. And then the clitoris is not just, it. so it is part of external genitalia in the female reproductive system, but it's also part of the internal because if you look underneath, the skin what you see is that the clitoris actually extends over here so corpus cavernosum hey that sounds like those corpus cavernosa inside the penis right so the clitoris is erectile tissue and it's not just on the outside it's also on the inside as well so the corpus cavernosa can fill with blood and engorge with blood so the clitoris and the corpora cavernosa of the female reproductive gland is erectile tissue and then we also show the C is like not just about the external anatomy, but you also see all these other things. Like here we have our, our Bartholin's glands here, and we also have all these bulbs of the vestibule. So you have many openings, and also like it's not just about the surface. You have actually this amazing like uh, internal anatomy of the of the internal genitalia of the female reproductive system. Now. Here we have like, so again, this picture of the um, martini is not that it's like, this is natural, it's not showing that. It's, what it's showing is like, if you peel back the skins, this is where we would see the bulb of the vestibule and the Bartholin's glands. Now let's say, okay, so we're past the vestibule. Now let's actually look inside the vaginal entrance. So what we have here, yeah, again, the vestibule, not quite here in the vagina yet, but once you get past the hymen, now you're in the vaginal canal, and then these are rugae. So remember how like the stomach has rugae, and there are these little folds that allow for expansion. So the rugae are like that in the vaginal canal. There are these little folds over here, and then you end up just before you get to this structure right here. You have something called the vaginal fornix, fornix, and then right here, this is actually the bottom part of the uterus, and you have something called the cervix. 
And yes, it sounds like cervical, like cervical and your neck. So this is like saying it's the neck of the uterus. And if we go here, so we have the cervix and then we have the uterus and there's all these ligaments that hold it in place. Now, is the uterus just like looking like this without any sort of anchoring? Well, no, these, I, so these, what we have is the uterus, we have these fallopian tubes and the ovaries. So it's not just free floating in the pelvic cavity, it's actually held by a series of ligaments. And here we have a example of like looking at the cervix. So speaking of the cervix, one way to check the whether the cervix is normal is doing some, a routine test called a pap, te, pap smear or Papa Nicolodau test. And what they do is take a sample of cells from the surface of the cervix and then they and then they use histology to look under a microscope and see if these cells look normal or if they might be precancerous. Now what we see here is like okay we have something called speculum and a speculum is allowing the so yes this is being inserted into the vagina and to allow the, the brush to go through. Now actually this is very interesting too because the speculum is, if it looks pretty ancient, this is like the classic speculum but now instead of having a cold metal object they might offer to warm it up or there's also plastic which wouldn't because again metal absorbs heat so plastic isn't going to be feel cold as well and also is like the, there's also, it's not one size fit, fits all like if you're female and you have to do one of these tests and they, ha they there, there's also like I think in a movement in the United Kingdom where they do self-tests, but again, sometimes they're like, oh, I'm not sure if I got a correct, uh, in a, a good sample, cervical sample for pap smear. So they're trying to evolve it and try to evolve the speculum so it's no longer metal, and so it's a more comfortable shape. And again, this is like also, it is inserted into the vagina. So another thing is like, if you have a male OBGYN and you're not, and you're not comfortable with that, you can actually ask for a female witness or observer to observe that as well. And sometimes like you can, there's also other ways to, you don't necessarily need to, they're trying to find ways like, is a speculum necessary? And actually this is ongoing debate to this day. So, but the thing is that why are you doing that? You're trying to see like, okay, what if there is precancerous tissue? So this is the whole reason for a pap smear is that you're trying to take a sample of the cells from the surface, surface of the cervix and speculum or not. So you're try what happens is the pathologist will look at it later and they'll say like, okay, is it normal looking or is it precancerous? Like here we have a cancerous cell with like multiple nuclei and here we have a cancer cell with abnormal cell morphology and shape. So they're trying to make sure that this, they catch cancer, any potential cancer early so that you can get early treatment instead of the cancer spreading throughout the rest of your body. Okay, so what we have is the cervix. And now we are at the uterus. So the uterus is held in place with all the, so it's not, again, not just free floating. You actually have it held by multiple ligaments that also help, help hold the uh, ovaries as well. So you have many ligaments, ligaments that anchor the uterus. And I like this picture better from the McGraw-Hill version. So what we have here is the pelvis. And then we see that these ligaments help to hold the uterus in place and anchor it. So it's not just moving around. It's actually for pretty like firmly anchored and held in place by all these ligaments. If we look inside the uterine wall, what we have are three main layers, or actually like two main layers and then the surrounding layer. So the main layers, so we have the perimetrium. So that's kind of like the covering of the uterus. Then we have the myometrium and then we have the endometrium. So endo meaning inner, so that endo is that prefix that means inner. So then the endometrium is the innermost layer that's shed with every menstrual cycle. Myo again means muscle. So this is the muscular layer of the uterus. And yeah, I'll have to go a little over time just to finish the uterus, but yeah, so what, what, why is that important? Well, endometrial cancer, and this is another type of exam, so it's not the same as a pap smear. So a pelvic exam is when you, the ob gyn does this. The, so what they do is like, they have to, during a typical pelvic exam, yes, they do insert some fingers in one hand, or not the entire hand, but a few fingers into the vagina. But they also just try to feel the overall shape, the direction, and the how, whether there's any hard abnormal masses inside the uterus. So, and they're also going to fill the fallopian tubes and ovaries as well. So they're just trying to see like, okay, is there any abnormal lumps or something that's unusual in terms of the feel? 
But so one thing, what reason why they might try to do a pelvic exam is like they're trying to check for endometrial cancer. So cancers in general are like you have all these cells packed into a small area. So cancers compared to the normal tissue, they tend in general tend to feel harder than the surrounding tissue. So endometrial cancer is one of those that will feel that way. Now, the pelvic exam is invasive. I mean, pap smears are invasive. Do you have to insert something into the vagina? So it's actually interesting because this is like, a, here we have the, the um, ob guys fighting with the internal medicine folk. Like I, I think back in 2017, what we saw is like, okay, the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists were recommending pelvic examinations in women who were asymptomatic. So that means healthy and no symptoms. But internal medicine was saying like, okay, you don't need a pelvic exam, annual pelvic exam in asymptomatic, non-pregnant adult women. And it's interesting because the initial, like the, this recommendation back in 2017, and that's only five years ago, has been withdrawn. And now this has been updated from the American Co College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. They now agree with internal medicine that you don't need an annual pel pelvic exam if you if a female is asymptomatic. So again, it's like, so just because it doesn't mean that, so you, you have consent, you have agency, and you don't have to do it if you're uncomfortable with a male OBG guy doing it. You can have a female observer and witness along with you so if you're not comfortable. Or if you're asymptomatic and there's no reason, you can refuse. There's other things like ultrasounds as well. So again, pelvic exams, they're, they're just physical exams in general. They've, like, I think the, if you look at the statistics, like how good are these pelvic exams at detecting cancers? It's about, I think when I, I have to find the, that resource, but I think it's around 44%. So it's like, okay, it might, it's, Maybe at best, close to half the time they can detect via pelvic exam, but you may be able to do an ultrasound or other image to kind of detect these potential cancers. But yes, this is what a pelvic exam is. And one thing that they might feel, like say it's a lump, does that mean it's cancer? No, it could be something that we call fibroids or leomyomas. So uterine fibroids are something that can occur and develop in the myometrium. So this is interesting, it's happening in the muscular layer of the uterus. So again, and look like this, yeah, these are pretty big. So what, it looks like a big golf ball over here, but these look, they, these look pretty um, graphic and pretty like, uh, yeah, abnormal, but this is like, is it typically life-threatening? The Even though they're very big, they rarely become cancerous. So even though they're they're abnormal growths, they but the thing is that you should get them checked out because you don't it's better to be safe than sorry. Like even though they they rarely become cancerous, this is something like, oh and but the other thing is that they can also cause pain and they can also cause other th symptoms as well. But fibroids, that's where they occur in the other layer. So this is what happens with those fibroids. And another year useful, so you sometimes, most of the times you hear the, when anything refers to the uterus, you hear utero. There's also another prefix called hystero, so hysterogram. And this is why I want to show you this. Now, does this uterus look normal to you? And what we, so in these pictures of anatomy or just, just your textbook in general, you see everyone's like looking like a triathlete with 10% or lower body fat. Everyone's fit and everything's symmetrical, everything that uterus is full. Well, this is a normal uterus. And from this radiology, this is the uterus right here. And yes, this is dye being used for this x-ray. And notice this uterus is slightly off toward the right of the body. So, I mean, sometimes like, just like the male reproductive system, sometimes things lean left or right. Sometimes you, and that's also with the speculum. If you have to use a speculum, like do you, if it's painful, tell your, tell, tell your doctor or whoever you're, your clinician is because again this is they should use a size that's comfortable for you it shouldn't be pain, a painful experience and then hysterogram by what i'm showing you here is that sometimes things uh, if right is your is normal for you that's normal if left is normal for you that's also normal as well and then a hystero seal is also something interesting because sometimes is like yeah and this isn't it's, it's funny, it's like spelled the same in French, but it just has the accent uh, aigu and grave here. 
but yeah, what this is the normal arrangement of the uterus, but hysterocele is kind of like a hernia of the uterus. So what we have is the uterus slipping through the, the abdominal wall or sometimes the pelvic floor, and then they have a displacement of the hystero. So this is just what I'm getting at here. Hystero is also a useful prefix. And another thing is a hysterectomy. So say the cancer, this is like, again, this is going to affect reproduction. So this is why hysterectomy is kind of like a uh, very radical, or I shouldn't say like, but a very, um, like if they would just want to make sure that do we, to get rid of cancerous tissue and prevent any growth of the cancer to surrounding tissues, they might say, suggest a hysterectomy or sometimes it's also in reproductive control as well. So hysterectomy, you're going to remove part or all the uterus and there's different degrees. I don't expect you to know which degrees and yeah, it's been like partial. You remove some of the uterus but you keep the cervix and then total you remove the uterus and the cervix. And radical, you actually move remove part of the upper vagina. And it's not all the vagina, because again, that's an opening to the body. But what happens is like hysterectomy depends on just degrees just men. You're removing at least part or all of the uterus. And I think I'll and let's see, ooh, let's finish with this. So pelvic exams. So another reason why they say like pelvic exams, if if you have pelvic pain and you're just like, ooh, it's like it's burning when I'm urinating, or it's like, oh, I feel like a a, a real pain in my lower, like, uh, it's like below my intestines, and it feels like it's in my pelvis area. So they might do a pelvic exam to check for pelvic inflammatory disease, and here we have the fallopian tubes that collect, co connect the ovaries to the uterus. So this is another reason why they might do a pelvic exam if someone has symptoms. But one is one possible cause of this is ST or STIs. And STIs, the sexual transmitted infections, they're considered separate from urinary chip or urinary tract infections because like these are again STI means sexually transmitted. But things that most people and male or female, actually males have or more males are asymptomatic than than, than females, but most people with chlamydia infections are asymptomatic. So someone could have chlamydia and pass it to their partner without knowing. Now in, this is why it's important if you're if you're active in intercourse and sexually active is that infertility occurs in 20 to 10 to 20 percent of females with untreated chlamydia. So it would be say a female is asymptomatic and they have a chlamydia infection. I mean if you want children later on it's better that you you don't have you get treated if you're asymptomatic, then to find out later that you were asymptomatic and be robbed of the chance if you choose to have that later on in life. So where can you go? And the thing is like the university health services, this is a, they're supposed to be confidential. So they have a women's health clinic that can do all these exams like pap smears and STD testing as well. And not just for, for females, you can also go there for males as well. And there's also local clinics here in on the island that can also, they're public services. So again, it's better to get checked if you're active and not be, if you do want children later on in life. It's best that you take care of your health now so that you're not robbed of a chance that you, you do just because you were asymptomatic earlier. Okay, sorry to go over, but yeah, this is like a little public so health service announcement. It's like, yeah, especially like, yeah, I mean, there are resources and this is like stuff that you are able to access as students and residents of Hawaii. All right, enjoy your weekend, take care, stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll continue with the re female reproductive system and the menstrual cycle, which gets its own lecture on Monday. Take care, see you then.